we are certified elder law attorneys. Um, your profession is certified financial planners. It's very similar in the sense that you have to practice in this field exclusively and show uh, the Bar Association that you have the experience and the knowledge to hold yourself out as an expert. So with us today, I guess I want to look at the camera to welcome Matt Parker from Marshall Parker Weber, uh, elder law firm, right? That's is that right. all you guys do or is that really, I mean, you've built up a heck of a reputation in that yeah. category. Yeah, elder law is the primary area of focus uh, that it helps people who are older, yeah. uh, maybe retirement age and up. Uh, you know, we do a lot of estate planning, which a lot of lawyers do, such as wills, powers of attorney and trusts and the like. But we tend to focus on the older adults who are interested in preserving assets or they're worried about long-term care costs. Okay. I'm excited. First of all, be careful when we say elder, right? You know? <laughs> I sat next yes. to a gentleman yesterday who was 68 and I'm 53. Yeah. Right. And he looked at me and he said, well, you're about my age. And I thought, mm. <laughs> All right. That's, yeah. well, that's what other topic. We're getting our AARP mailings at 50 now. So yeah. who knows? It is a little early. Yes. Yeah, I, st I had a couple of those. But anyway. Um, so, Matt, I, well, before I do that, I want to also introduce Larry Alderson. So, Larry works alongside of me in Stonehouse as an advisor. Larry, I'm psyched that you're here because on this topic, I think you also have a lot of experience with the clients uh, from the financial planning side. So sort of marrying what we're doing as financial planners with the elder law attorneys and making sure uh, that everything is is sticking with, with the client's overall goals and, and also the client's family's goals, right? So um, a lot of times uh, I don't see those professionals necessarily working together, but I think everybody here at this table has a good amount of experience with making that happen. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a pretty good lineup here today. So, and my favorite part is that this will be a podcast where I talk the least, at least I hope that, because <laughs> you guys have a lot of knowledge and experience here. So let me start with this, Matt. If I could just ask you, um, for the, we're going to go through maybe like 10 bullet points of things that we want to make sure we hit on. Mm -hmm. And somebody that's watching this, just watching, starting from scratch here, what kind of person should be paying attention to this moment in their life, to this, what we're going to talk about here? What's going on in someone's life where they, they really have to say, hey, this video is probably going to hit on the things that are important to me? Sure. Uh, most of the time, people are reaching retirement age and they're looking at the next chapter of their life. And they're starting to think about things that they perhaps have put off or not thought of in the past when they were working for a living, saving for retirement. And some of those issues deal with estate planning. Do I have the proper documents in place, wills and powers of attorney and so forth? But they're also concerned about preserving their assets for the next generation. Right. And they're starting to think about, well, you know, maybe my mother-in-law entered a nursing home and I saw how much money she had to spend on the cost of her care. And I know, I know that's a threat. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I want to preserve some of that money and maybe the home from the potential threat that w either myself or my spouse could enter a nursing home and be exposed to the cost of that care. So those are typically the clients. They reach retirement and they're starting to think about, well, what could happen down the road 20 years from now? And that's when they start asking questions about who's, who's going to help me preserve these assets? Where do I go? Right. Oh, that's a good segue. Yeah. So the second part of my question is an elder law attorney. Yeah. In fact, a certified elder law attorney. So yeah. what makes you guys special, specially qualified to talk about all those topics? Well, yeah, my partner and I, Tammy Weber, uh, we are certified elder law attorneys. Um, your profession is certified financial planners. It's very similar in the sense that you have to practice in this field exclusively and show uh, the Bar Association that you have the experience and the knowledge to hold yourself out as an expert. Mm -hmm. uh, most attorneys aren't allowed to do that, but certified elder law attorneys are allowed to say, this is what I do for a living. You have to take, uh, in essence, an extra bar exam. 
so many continuing continuing legal education requirements every year. You have to be sponsored by your peers. So there are lots of steps we have to go through to become certified elder law attorneys. But it does distinguish us from perhaps a general practitioner who doesn't have the experience or the knowledge in terms of asset preservation or helping qualify somebody for medical assistance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, speaking of uh, experience as a CFP. I'm glad you, you mentioned that. I mm -hmm. forgot to introduce you as a certified financial planner professional. Um, Larry, you made you helped me put this list together. In fact, you added some really great content here that I, I'm excited to go through. The first one on, on that list is, is uh, reluctance that somebody has to bring in and reach out to somebody like Matt. Yeah, we talked to we talk to clients all the time and they bring up some of those very topics that you mm -hmm. said that they worry about. And, and and then we recommend that they talk to somebody like you and they say things like, oh, these guys are expensive. You know, anytime we talk mm -hmm. to somebody like that, we've heard, you know, and they'll quote some prices and well, how, how, how would you address that? I mean, how much, what mm -hmm. about just for a telephone call for mm -hmm. a consultation? Mm -hmm. Well, when you call into our office, uh, nowadays you have the option of meeting with us via Zoom or nice. you know, conference call or, uh, you know, in person. Uh, we have more than one office and there is a consultation fee. Uh, there's a $275 fee to sit down with an attorney and talk with us for at least an hour. Um, and then we assess your situation and determine what sort of services you want. It might be some estate planning just to start. Uh, maybe it's asset pres preservation and you want to trust to try and preserve assets. Maybe you're facing the nursing home placement for your mother or your father. Somebody's entering in a facility. So that's a different type of service. The beauty of elder law attorneys is they tend to always quote you the fee up front and they say it's going to cost X number of dollars. This is the price. It's not I'm going to charge hourly and I have no idea how long it's going to take and it could go on and on. Uh, so estate planners and elder law attorneys tend to quote you the fee up front. Um, if that's in your price range, then great. Um, mm -hmm. Attorneys like other financial professionals charge different fees. Uh, mm -hmm. So you certainly can shop around and find a fee that uh, fits your budget. And there tends to be options. You know, you, you don't not everybody needs a trust. You might just need a deed transferring ownership of your home, and that's a lot less expensive. So with an attorney, you can talk about what are the price ranges for the different options and find the one that fits your budget. Very good. And so for in your firm's case, yeah. $275 to, to just find out, yeah. right? Right. And, and, and then you have the visit. And then you know, here are the options uh, in terms of preserving assets or uh, helping qualify my loved one for care. What's it going to take? Uh, and you walk away with a basic idea of what the plan will be. I mean, that certainly seems like a small price to pay mm -hmm. in this day and age, $275. You can mm -hmm. spend that pretty easily at the grocery store. Yeah, uh, <laughs> almost. Um, it depends on the size of your family. You probably can yeah. carry it out in two hands. That's right. Uh, so... I just Good. took my daughter to a concert over yeah. the weekend, and I think the tickets were probably about that. So that's yeah. I think probably. that's a pretty fair yeah. trade off. Yeah. And it wasn't Taylor Swift. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not going to say who it was. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I like that what you mentioned was, were levels, right? Yeah. Like having that initial consultation. And, and some elder law attorneys uh, that I know in the past have said, like, th you're all in. Like, if you want me to engage, it's – an expensive thing and this, we're doing everything for you but it seemed like there was no middle road it yeah. sounds like you have different different ways that you can work with folks yeah we're more of an a la carte you okay. you, you pick the what the service you want yeah. um some attorneys have plans where they want to represent you from the beginning to the end yes and they want to chew to essentially have a life planning fee or something along those yeah. lines that will provide estate planning services and then long-term care services all in one package. Right. And so there's a bundled uh, quote for that. Uh, that is not our firm. We we have a la carte services for documents separate from medical assistance planning. So you purchase what you need when you need it. Perfect. Um, you want to talk about what I think is the biggest uh, thing that I always get asked by folks is, is about protecting mom or dad's home. Yeah, so many times we have people that have this preconceived notion that, oh, mom's mom's health is failing, mm -hmm. so I'm certainly going to lose the house. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could w um, demystify that process a little mm -hmm. bit for people that 
Uh, what exactly happens when they go into uh, or when they need to start receiving mm -hmm. long term care? Yeah, this is probably the most commonly asked question. Will I lose the home uh, if I place my loved one in a nursing home? Uh, are they going to make me sell the home? Those sorts of questions are always coming up. So you have to put it in context. What are people thinking of? Uh, they're thinking of some sort of placement in a facility, typically. They're not thinking of home care. They're thinking, I'm going to place my loved one in a home and I'm going to have to sell my house as a consequence of that. Um, so when people enter a nursing home, it's a very expensive investment. Uh, it can be somewhere between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars a month, depending upon the facility. Um, so it's very expensive to pay for uh, nursing facility care, and that's where the issue of will the home have to be sold comes up. It might just be a question of how am I going to pay for this? Okay, um, but there is a program out there called medical assistance. Uh, sometimes called Medicaid by the federal government, but medical assistance will pay for somebody's care in a facility as long as they're there. You just have to qualify financially. Now, they don't make you sell the house to get on medical assistance. Uh, the house is an exempt resource. You can keep it. So you could have a wife living at home while the husband's in the nursing home. The wife gets to stay there as long as she wants, okay? So they don't make you sell it. Now, probably what people hear about is the widow down the street who went to the nursing home and they had to put her house up for sale. Well, that was a practical issue. There was nobody living there anymore and they couldn't afford to keep the nursing, uh, the house going while somebody was in the nursing home, so they had to sell the home. But nobody was making them sell it. The government doesn't make you sell the home. The nursing home doesn't make you turn the house over to them. Yeah, I've, I've had people yeah. that have yeah. $2 million in investments and mm -hmm. they think they're going to lose their, that they have to give up their house when they go into the nursing home. They don't. Uh, the nursing home just wants to get paid. So if mm -hmm. your $2 million client can pay the bill, that's fine. They're getting paid. If somebody with more limited resources doesn't have the money to pay the nursing home, they're qualifying for medical assistance. Now, there is a program associated with medical assistance called the state recovery. So the government keeps track of all the dollars they pay towards the cost of your care when you're on medical assistance. If you happen to own the home when you die, well, then they are allowed to put a lien on the home. In most cases, particularly when you're working with an elder law attorney, we're trying to find a way to get the home out of your name so you don't own it when you pass and so the government can't claim against it. So in a married situation, oftentimes we're just transferring the home from a husband to a wife. Um, so there are ways to shelter the home from the estate recovery program. Uh, but that is out there and that may be some of the, the fears people have about you know qualifying for assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have to actually own the home for that program to apply. Um, and most of the time people don't own anything when they pass away on medical assistance. Right, very good. Um, you know, another one of the uh, preconceived notions that people hear and talk about mm. is this look back rule when they're qualifying mm. for medical assistance. And a lot of people still think that it's a three year look back, it, but maybe you could uh, pontificate yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's been five years for a long time um, and there's no current plan to extend it. When I started practicing, it was three years. It was quite a while ago. Um, that shows all of our ages. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But people I, still do remember three years. They do. That. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, the whole idea of the look back period is that when you apply for assistance, the government wants to know what did you do with your assets? Uh, and they go back five years. They ask you to bring in statements from all your bank accounts, the open ones, the closed ones, your financial accounts, at least year end statements to see what was going on during the course of the year. And what they're looking for are large transfers of money or resources to somebody else in the form of a gift. Is you're not getting anything back. You're not compensating somebody for some service. Um, they're not looking for little transfers. So you can give money at Christmas time to grandkids. Sure. You can tie to the church. You can give to your grandson's wedding. All those things are allowable. What they're looking for are large sums of money, thousands of dollars going to somebody for no reason at all. You know, you're not buying something from them. You'd be surprised how many older adults are giving away large sums of money to kids and grandkids. I mean, we're in the financial services industry. We know what families are like and it, would, it goes on. And so the government wants to say, listen, 
if you want to qualify for our services to pay for your loved one's care, you can't have given away money over the last five years that you could have used to pay for your care. So they're trying to discourage people from impoverishing themselves right before somebody goes to a nursing home. Mm -hmm. We understand there are these honest gifts being made to kids and grandkids for reasons other than sheltering the assets, but they get caught in this web. So you have to disclose them, and if there are transfers, then they determine how long you are not eligible. Roughly speaking, for every $11,500 that you give away in, a, in, a, in, the, in this time frame, you're not eligible for one month. $11,500. So you take the total amount of all these gifts that are transfers yep. that have happened over the last five years, right. divide it by roughly 11500 and mm -hmm. that equals the amount of months mm -hmm. that you're disqualified from receiving right. medical assistance. Right. That's exactly right. So if you gave away only $5,000, it's an inconsequential amount of time, mm -hmm. okay? So don't worry about the small transfers. What they're looking for is 50 grand given away here, 60 grand there, 70 grand, and all of a sudden those numbers add up, and that's when you make yourself ineligible for a long period of time. Now, what's a family to do if they find themselves ineligible for a period of time? Call the elder law attorney <laughs> as quickly as possible, make an appointment. Uh, there are ways to try and deal with these transfers. And hopefully they still have some money, okay? If they've completely impoverished themselves and they've given away these resources, it's very difficult to address that issue, okay? Mm -hmm. But if you still have some resources and you realize, whoa, 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 we gave away the cabin to our kids two years ago and we gave away another 50 grand to our daughter in Arizona. She was having some, some difficulties with her life. So uh, there might be $100,000 worth of gifts, but you still have money. Well, you can address that problem. Mm -hmm. There are ways to fix it. Um, so come see the attorney and uh, we'll work out a plan to try and fix these gifts that have been made during the last five years. What if somebody tried to sell their, let's say they sold their home that was worth $400,000 for mm -hmm. $50,000? That's, that's a, a sale. That's not a gift. Uh, actually, it is. It's a part gift. You're, you are making a sale and is that you, you're saying, I'm going to sell this property to you, but I'm going to sell it way below market value. So it's a $400,000 home. You're making a $350,000 gift in that transaction. Uh, so it's often do done with kids, grandkids. I don't want to sell the property for market value to my grandson, so I'm going to cut the price in half. Um, so that is a, a considered a gift in the eyes of the government. And the government actually checks into that. The government will know. That's right. So we talked a little bit about trusts and mm -hmm. people, people, I've had clients see in the paper where people are transferring mm -hmm. assets from their own name to a revocable trust. And I've had people say that that's what they're, that, that those people are planning for nursing home care, uh, asset protection. Sure. Uh, so uh, transfers to trusts go on all the time, but there are many, many different types of trusts out there. And people are creating trusts and transferring their property to them for different reasons. Uh, revocable trusts are typically used for estate planning purposes. They, by their term, can be undone at any time. You transfer your house to the trust today, you can take it back tomorrow. There's no giving up of ownership or control. Mm -hmm. uh, it's yours. The purpose of the document is essentially to avoid probate, which is a process by which we have to settle someone's estate when they passed away. Mm -hmm. In some states in our country, probate is an onerous process. It's very expensive. It takes a long time. You need the court's involvement. So revocable trusts serve the purpose of avoiding that headache of probate. Mm -hmm. uh, Pennsylvania, not so bad. But some people still have revocable trusts. Um, but those types of trusts don't shelter assets from being counted if you want to apply for medical assistance. Everything in there is still yours. So if you want to shelter assets, you have to use something called an irrevocable trust. The very term irrevocable means this is a permanent arrangement. You have transferred assets to this trust that you can't get back, at least not on your own. There are... Systems in all of these trusts that say, listen, although you can't get the assets back, somebody else could access the trust or you could transfer assets to other people, such as your children and grandchildren. And consequently, there is in theory a way to return the assets to you with the cooperation of someone else. But you on your own can't have the assets returned to you. Gotcha. Okay. So kind of an escape hatch. 
Yes. Uh, most clients wouldn't set these up if there wasn't an escape hatch. Right, right. Uh, just the permanency of it all scares people. So uh, typically, an attorney will build in the escape hatch that says the people who created it, the parents, can transfer assets to any one of their children. And so if they wanted to transfer money from the trust to their daughter, the daughter would have access to the money at that point and the daughter that could then buy what the parents want or use the money for the parents' benefit or even return it to them if, if that's what the parents wanted. So many clients say, well, why don't I just give it to the kids? Yes, that is the old school way of doing things. Just turn the property or money over to the children. The problem with today's families is if you line 10 families up, half of them are going to have functional families where everybody gets along and there are no problems with any of the kids. Really? There'll be five? <laughs> okay. Maybe I'm exaggerating, <laughs> but uh, let's hope there is five. And then the other five have issues. And so parents come to me and say, I've got these three kids and this kid has this problem. And then I don't get so much along with that kid's wife. And then I've got, well, I, uh, well let's not talk about the other. And they, I, I, I'm worried about turning over assets to them because A, I'll never see them again. And B, what if I want to take the property back or the money back? How do I control that process? Therein lies the discussion about the trust. Well, you can create a trust and put your assets in there. It's not a permanent disposition and is that you can always change the beneficiaries down the road with a trust. You're not stuck to an equal share. You can leave more to one, less to another. You haven't put anything in the kids' names until you pass away with a trust. The trust lasts until your lifetime and then when you're deceased, then it goes to the children in some shares. So you avoid turning things over to the kids. And like I said, there's this escape hatch where you could reverse the process if you wanted to. So that appeals to a lot of these families who don't have the perfect family scenario. And even in a perfect family scenario, yeah. is it not true that a, a very functional family can have things happen to it that right. could wind up Mm -hmm. taking those assets that are really, if, if I'm the father, mm -hmm. somebody else's life decisions or, or circumstances mm -hmm. can affect my my assets, my home. Sure. We, we don't have the crystal ball as attorneys. Uh, you know, we don't know if I counsel the client to turn over the property to their kids, one of the kids won't predecease them. Right. Uh, one of the kids won't get sued, uh, you know, because once it's in their name, the, the asset is theirs. I mean, and they, they own it. They can use it and enjoy it just like any other property or monies or investments. And one of the other things we haven't talked about, which is kind of boring, but it's taxes. Um, <laughs> you know, there, there okay is. With that. We do taxes. Yeah. Here too, so. uh, but there are. There are capital gains taxes in some of these assets, whether it's real estate or stock, and you may be passing on a capital gains tax obligation to your kids just by turning it over to them, and then they have to sell it down the road. They end up paying a much higher tax bill versus using a trust, which allows them to reset what's called their basis in the asset when you pass away. Yeah, think about, I mean, for for those that are still watching this <laughs> this presentation yeah. that's a significant yeah. think about what a person bought their house for yeah. in 1960 mm. versus what it's worth today yeah and if that could be no capital gains in that that's quite a difference yeah it, it can be significant a lot of the clients i represent bought their house eons ago and they'll joke that i can't even buy a car for what i paid my house for <laughs> right. right you know or uh, can't buy a countertop from my home yeah. <laughs> for what I paid for the house. The, the prices have dramatically increased. But, you know, the, the real estate market has been going gangbusters recently. And so the prices of these houses are much greater than they were. And if they were to be sold today, that would be an enormous capital gain op tax obligation. Now, the owner doesn't have to pay that up to a quarter million dollars worth of gain. But uh, the recipient, the child who doesn't live there, they would be obligated to pay that tax. Right, right. So, yeah, that's significant. Yeah. I, I really appreciate the your insight on the revocable trust because I can say up here where we have landowners, right, with, with gas royalties and things, specifically I can name, obviously not going to name, I can think of a handful of people who have a lot of estate, a lot of value there, but uh, someone convinced them to do a revocable trust and they feel like it's going to take care of some of these matters, which you clearly made a point that it won't. The other thing is, <clears throat> excuse me, they they did the trust 
but they failed to retitle the assets to actually put them in the trust, at least some of the assets. So there's there's just a lot of inefficiencies. So I just love, obviously, we're fans of professionals that know what they're doing and actually bring value to the client. And when the client actually listens to those professionals and, and everybody's on the same team, it works so much better <laughs> than just say, oh, well, my neighbor did this, so I'm going to do this. We're only about halfway through these topics and you guys are uncovering so many intricacies and nuances and every family is different. And so you really need to custom fit this. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, you know, revocable trusts have been around a long time and they work for some people. Mm -hmm. You know, some of my clients are snowbirds and they have property in different states and they want to avoid okay. probate in yeah. multiple states. And so it works well for them. Uh, but they've been oversold. Yeah. They, they are one of those uh, estate planning documents where uh, they've been sold as a you know, a cure-all for everything. Right, that's such exactly, as yeah. I saving, went to a seminar, yeah. and now I'm going to do this thing, and I took care of my estate issues. And yeah. I'm like, uh, yeah. Anyway, they, they, yeah. Larry, you keep going, man. You that's okay. No, that's, that's a huge point, and, yeah. and I, I feel like that selling of revocable trust isn't maybe as prolific as it once was. You're right. I think the Attorney General cut, cracked down on that some time ago, but still, they're yeah. out there. Yeah. Absolutely. We still see the the, the offers to come visit uh, at a certain restaurant in town and somebody who typically is not local will come into your town and offer the service. Yeah. 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 We see the same thing. Yeah. In our, yeah. yeah. Um, so w one of the, we've been you've been talking a lot about strategies mm -hmm. to to qualify for, you know, for asset protection. What role do you see that long term care insurance might have in this mm -hmm. equation? Well, we were alluding to the fact that we've been practicing quite a while, and I think uh, you and I can go back 20, 25 years and think of the world of long-term care insurance and how different that world was than it is today. Very much so. Uh, they were being sold a lot 20, 25 years ago. Uh, many companies were involved in the sale of the product, and there were a lot of people buying them. Um, and when they worked, they worked really well. Uh, when you had a claim under one of the policies from a good company uh, and you had the right amount of benefit, you could use that insurance to pay the cost of your care. And it might not even be in a nursing home. It might be in assisted living. It might be some home-based care. Uh, so those policies were helpful for the people who could afford them. The problem is the industry has changed a lot over the years, and I don't see them being sold much anymore. A lot of the companies pulled out. We don't have to go into all the reasons, but it just wasn't a profitable, let's just say, business for them to stay in. And so you don't see a lot of those policies being sold. And the people predominantly who have them are getting these letters perhaps once a year saying your premiums are going up. And, and not the, just a little. Yeah, right. a lot. So the companies are trying to pull out of the business. And so they come to me and they ask me questions about what should I drop in terms of the benefits? What should I keep? Um, should I, you know, they, they've been very reluctant to drop them because of the fear that something could happen in the near future. But So I don't see traditional long-term care insurance policies as much as I used to mm -hmm. as, as part of a typical estate plan. People who list what do they have. And, you know, if they have a plan, it's like an old group plan that hasn't increased in price too much over the years. Mm -hmm. um, some of the plans are now hybrid plans where people with more resources are buying not only a long-term care insurance policy, but also life insurance. Mm -hmm. And so they invest in that product knowing that, well, I've got a pool of money to pay for long-term care if it happens, but if it doesn't, I've got this life insurance benefit that'll go on to my kids. So I'm not losing the investment. That's certainly what we've used a lot more. In yeah. Uh, in here because yeah. as you very well said yeah. a lot of times if you have and in, in the old style mm -hmm. you could pay five eight ten thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. for many many years mm -hmm. and if you didn't need it that money has just basically been mm -hmm. right for nothing uh and if eventually you mm -hmm. drop it because mm -hmm. you can't bear the premium anymore it's for nothing where with a life insurance policy yeah. somebody's going to get something someday Yes, and that's what makes those policies appealing. And so there's there's an industry out there that's, that uh, provides that service to people. Um, it was always difficult to sell people on long-term care insurance because by the time they reach, you know, their 
closer to retirement age, they, they have insurance fatigue. Mm -hmm. They've paid right. one too many premiums and it was difficult to sell that product anyways. Uh, but uh, today it's, you know, hard to find someone to sell it and sell it at a price that people can afford. Well, that's another reason why a lot of the folks <laughs> like the hybrid, because often it's it's done as a paid up. Mm -hmm. It's a one. It's not a. It's not salt in the wound every year when you get the premium. Mm -hmm. It's usually done as we take a portion of the portfolio and place mm -hmm. it into this mm -hmm. uh, contract so that that piece of their plan is all mm -hmm. buttoned up and mm -hmm. set aside and they can kind of go on with it with life. Yep. So, yes, I, I concur that that's what we're seeing the mm -hmm. industry. Not too many of those traditional ones. It's, it's even hard to find companies that want to write those anymore. I agree. Yeah. When, so when's too too early or too late to contact you? If, if people are watching this and they're sticking with us. <laughs> I think this is, to me, this is one of the best questions. Yeah. What, we get asked this so if you're, lot. you know, when when is it too early to contact you? That That's probably not too much of a problem. <laughs> well, keep in mind as an estate planning and elder law attorney, I'm meeting with clients who are younger. Occasionally, I will meet with a young family that's getting started. They want the basic estate planning documents, the wills and the powers of attorney if something were to happen to them. And then as they usually leave those alone until they get older and their kids grow and then they revise the estate plan. So oftentimes I'm meeting with clients near retirement and then they're looking back over things and they're starting to revise those documents, the wills and the powers of attorney. And at that point, they are asking me questions about, well, what about a trust to protect the home? Is that something I should be doing now? So it's usually at retirement age, they're starting to ask that question. And the, the conversation I have with them is, well, have you really settled down and figured out what the next chapter of your life is going to look like? Are you settled in a place where you think you're going to stay? Or is this a scenario where you might pick up and move to be closer to your son or daughter that's in South Carolina or Arizona or somewhere else? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, have you thought about continuing care retirement communities? You know, that's appealing to some clients. Others are no way. I won't go there. But it's it's a discussion point we have to have about what is your future going to look like? Okay. Are, are you going to be a Pennsylvanian? You know, I don't want to set up an irrevocable trust for somebody who's going to move and become uh, a resident of South Carolina. I would rather they go to South Carolina and visit an elder law attorney there and talk about the asset protection plan for that state. Because every state's a little different. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a universal asset protection plan that I can put in place for you. Uh, what goes on in New Jersey, for example, dramatically different than Pennsylvania, and yet we're not right next door to each other. Mm -hmm. um, so I think at the retirement age, they're starting to contemplate asset protection, but they're not going to pull the trigger yet. Uh, they're going to wait maybe until they get closer to 70. And then they're going to say, okay, now I've, I, I'm settled in on what we're doing. We're staying here in Pennsylvania. We're taking care of the grandkids. We're, whatever it is their life looks like at that point, they're more comfortable with the idea. Okay, yeah, I want to shelter this home. Let's, let's put it into an irrevocable trust. I want my daughter to, I've talked with her about it. She's, she's on board with it. She's going to be the trustee. And, uh, and we, we feel good about doing it right now because we're not going to, if we can, we're going to stay in our home for the rest of our days. We've talked about getting home-based care or, or something else to, to stay there as long as we can. Good. And is there a point in which it's too late um, you made an allusion earlier to the fact that if if uh, if, if if certain triggers are met, get to an elder law attorney ASAP. So is there a, a point in which it's too late? Well, I think uh, there are a couple of scenarios you could outline. Some people think, well, I've just had to place my mother-in-law in a nursing home. It's probably too late to protect assets. No, that's where attorneys tend to do their best work. We come up with ways to shelter assets even at the 11th hour. We can protect a lot of assets in a married situation, perhaps even all the assets that are out there. Um, there are asset pre preservation techniques we can use between a husband and a wife that we can't use between a parent and a child. Okay, So there's no look back period between a husband and a wife. So I can transfer everything from one person's name to another. Okay, uh, I can set up what are called Medicaid qualifying annuities for the spouse who's not going in the nursing home. So I can shelter a lot of assets in that annuity for the spouse who's healthy. 
Uh, so I can do a lot of creative things to shelter assets in a married situation. Now, in a single person situation, you can still shelter assets. It's more challenging, however. Okay. And the older the person gets, the less likely we're going to be sheltering much of anything. If I have a 90 something year old widow who never wanted to give up control of her house or assets, and there's still money there, it's going to be more difficult at 94 to protect some of these assets. We gotcha. just don't have enough time. Uh, but other than those outlier situations, most of the cases where somebody is just going to a nursing home and they never wanted to do asset protection planning, that's when you pick up the phone and call the elder law attorney. Because mo- many of our cases are just that. Nobody wanted to give up the house or give up the monies. And so we have to, to do planning at that time. Gotcha. That's good to know. <laughs> How do you navigate a situation where uh, this is a, a situation that, that Bob and I were talking about earlier? A lot of our clients might have been in business and they might have a relationship with a local attorney maybe with commercial real estate or general practitioner, and he's been their guy or mm. their person, you know, their professional, trusted professional all through the years. And we may have a sense that they really could use mm-hmm. an elder law attorney. How do you, na- how does that, how do you navigate those type of mm-hmm. professional situations? Well, you know, <laughs> Attorneys are supposed to recognize when they don't have the expertise to represent someone. And they're supposed to say, I can't handle this case. You need to go to somebody with that expertise. You know, I'm an elder law attorney. I'm not a patent lawyer. I'm not going to try and file a patent. I'm going to tell somebody, hey, go find a patent attorney Mm -hmm. or a tax attorney or a medical malpractice attorney. I don't do that work. Um, So... General practitioners should be telling their clients, listen, your case is a lot more sophisticated. I could certainly file the Medicaid application, but other than tell you to spend down your money, I'm not going to be able to give you any counsel on how to shelter these assets. I don't know how to do a Medicaid annuity and so on. So they should be willing to let go of those cases. Um, Keep in mind, as the client, you may come to me for that narrow service, asset protection, Medicaid planning. And you can just go back to your lawyer. You're not wed to me for anything else. I think that's what yeah. sometimes yeah. Uh, the local attorney yeah. might have a fear of is that yeah. if they if they go to mm-hmm. an elder law attorney, that that'll be the last time they ever see that client. Well, that that's the reality of any practice, I think, whether it's a dentist or an attorney, we all want to keep our clients. Um, but we're a specialist. We're only in this little narrow area and that's all we do. We're not going to engage in contracts or municipal work or auto accident claims. So uh, the fear that we're going to take the client is probably limited. You know, it's it's not a realistic fear. Mm-hmm. It's probably just a cultural issue that, that an older attorney has. Um, but if they're wise, they will recognize, hey, I can't help this client. I know of Marshall Parker and Weber. I know they do good work. I know this is their niche. They'll help these people file the medical assistance application, shelter the assets, and and do good work for them. And that's that's the right thing to do as an attorney. Very good. Yeah, it's funny you say that. I just had dinner with uh, an attorney um, from you know, Scranton, Wilkesbury area, and uh, I I said, hey, I hope hope you don't mind. I said uh, uh, next week I have you know someone from from your firm on on here. And uh, their response was exactly what mm-hmm. I would hope it would be, mm-hmm. as you just described. Uh, his response was, uh, I think that's fantastic. Those guys have an awesome reputation mm-hmm. for elder care. Uh, from what I understand, they really know what they, they're doing. And that's out of my area of expertise. So that'd probably be great for, for folks that you work with at Stonehouse to mm-hmm. hear what he has to say. Yeah. So there's a good example. It does happen. Yeah. They, uh, folks yeah. can play nice together and, yeah. and ultimately provide a really great overall uh, service to the client. Right. Very good. I didn't mean to jump in front of you. No. I really enjoy being the audience. I don't ever (laughs) get to just sit back and watch. So it's pretty cool. Well, I just want to, as are there any other um, timely issues that are happening in this field that you think our listeners ought to be aware of? You know, there's nothing that's going on there right now. 
you you may know it's an election year. Like, really? Okay. This year? Oh, yeah. So we don't. It's not something about that. There's, there's very little new that's coming down. Um, but uh, we have a good website. So if you wanted to reach out to us, it's called paelderlaw.com. That's paelderlaw.com. That's right. Okay. So if you go there, it talks about the firm. And if you wanted to sign up for a newsletter, uh, you can sign up for it. And every month it goes out and it lists new topics or topics that are, have advice in them about, hey, when should you update your power of attorney? Those sorts of topics come out. Uh, and so that's a way to keep up on the changes in the law. Uh, if you wanted to reach out to us as well, that's where you have the contact information. Very good. I appreciate that, Matt. And, and uh, I know Larry, uh, some of our other team have gone out to you. You guys have some great seminars that you yeah. give basically to other professionals in the area to say, hey, these are things that you need to be aware of when yeah. you're working with your clients and, and it's in our area. So uh, Larry loves those. I know he thinks they're they're super valuable. So mm -hmm. I hope you continue doing them. Mm -hmm. uh, gets the word out. You have offices in a couple places. Can you tell us the locations? Yeah. So uh, Plains, which is like right next door to Wilkes-Barre. Yep. Um, so so um, we're almost right downtown, uh, so we're pretty close to the Commonwealth Hospital. So if you know where that is, mm -hmm. our office is down there. Uh, we have an office in Williamsport, which is central Pennsylvania. And just, we actually started off in a little town called Jersey Shore, which is on the other side yeah. towards the west of uh, Williamsport. And um, yeah, there's a small satellite office out there still. And Given what you said at the beginning of this video, the mm -hmm. fact that you're able to uh, do Zoom meetings with folks yeah. and over the phone conversations. Mm -hmm. I go back to your original statement about uh, what, 275 for that, mm -hmm. you know, roughly hour of just mm -hmm. that, that initial consult. Mm -hmm. That seems so mm. affordable. Mm. We have folks that will often just say, I'm not sure where to start. And a lot of times it's not the mom or the dad, it's the son, uh, sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. What do we do with mom or dad's situation? How can we help? It's going to fall on our shoulders anyway. And to be able to just say, reach out to this firm, somebody that knows what they're talking about, they can give you their time and, and mm. uh, at least have a direction of where to go because I think they spin for a while mm -hmm. and then ultimately it might be a little bit closer to the too late side of things. Yeah. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you, you driving to our humble studio yeah. and, and making an appearance. I'd love this to not be your only appearance because mm -hmm. I don't know if you give yourself credit, but you're fantastic at this conversation. I yeah. like it. Well, I don't know. The second career, maybe. <laughs> Podcast. <laughs> Let's not get ahead of ourselves. I, I think we all need to stay in our lanes, right? I'd, I'd right. love to do this for a living, but uh, uh, yeah. uh, the other stuff is what the clients pay us for. So There you go. But this is great, though, because a lot of people, I think, are always – curious about mm. some of these topics and this this gives us a great resource to have on our site and you guys can use it on mm. yours as well but matthew thank you very much for, for doing this and larry thanks for coming with all these questions and content because uh we've seen it firsthand so my pleasure thank you mm.